Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. We're just about to get started here. Hello, everyone. I think we have enough people to start. Um, welcome. I'm Shireen from Peace Vigil. This is our webinar, COVID-19 and the economy. We are happy you can join us today for this very important subject. And we are excited to note that people have joined from various parts of the world let me list some of the countries we have here, um, people joining from Canada, United States, United Kingdom, I can see, Germany, uh, Italy, South Africa, of course, which is our home, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh. Our resource person today is Samir Dosani in addition to being one of Peace Vigil's founders. Sami's work on economics and its implications for peace has been used in over 16 countries. He has worked for years with grassroots workers around the world and with organizations including Amnesty International, ActionAid International, and Oxfam. His views are published in international journals and he is regularly interviewed in the electronic media for, the, for his understanding of how the current economic structures have worsened the injustices in society. Injustice, social, economic and political, and indeed they're all linked as we know, is violence, the opposite of peace. As a peace education organization, we are constantly trying to understand the ways by which a more peaceful world can be achieved. For participants who are new to our work, I would like to mention that we search history, culture, religion, and contemporary happenings to find out how humans have protected and promoted peace and continue to do so. We share this knowledge through stories, dramas, interviews with experts, quizzes, and also direct trainings and workshops. You can see a lot of our work on our YouTube channel. Let me show you a glimpse of the YouTube channel so that um, you have an idea of what I'm talking about uh, in case you're new to, to our organization, yes. So this is how our YouTube channel looks. And if you just do a Google search for Peace Vigil channel, you will find us. Um, now, we also do regular activities, which are a lot of fun. We have a fun interactive stuff, for instance, quizzes. Quizzes are available on our website which also has a lot of other interesting material. Our website is easy to remember, peacevigil.net. As you can see, I'm sure you can see it on the screen. There are a number of quizzes. We have uh, over a dozen quizzes. Um, you can see we have um, subjects like how epidemics changed history, climate change and peace, jazz and peace quiz. So there's a lot of stuff you can enjoy um, doing and at the same time you will learn about peace and you can share that knowledge with others. So peacevigil.net, please don't forget. 
all our efforts, and I must stress this, um, that all our efforts are directed towards one goal. And that goal is empowering everyone to become a messenger of peace wherever they are. As our logo, which is a vigilant eye says, let us look at our logo. This is a vigilant eye. And it says inside it, peace needs all of us. So that is our motto. That is what we believe in, that peace needs all of us. I invite you to be part of this journey. And uh, now that you are a part of this webinar, I hope you'll continue this journey with us. And I request Samir Dosani to share his thoughts now, which is our main presentation today on COVID-19 and the economy. Please note the rules before we start. So questions can be sent at any time. As you will notice at the bottom of the screen is uh, how you can ask questions. You can, question, uh, you can send questions at any time by raising your hand. There's a hand raise uh, icon there, you can raise your hand or you can type in questions. Uh, sorry, there is, um, the yes, you can uh, type into the chat or you can raise your hand if you're unsure of what's happening. You can also send us stuff like, I can't hear you and so on. There is some, somebody who said nothing. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's fine. Yeah, and please no abuse, of course. We all know that, that this is a peace education webinar. If we have disagreements, we have other ways to express it um, rather than personal abuse or, um, or bad words. And please do feel free to stay connected after this webinar if you have any more questions. And also you can email us um, at shireen at peacevigil.net. It's, uh, it's okay, we can give you the email address later as well. It's shireen at peacevigil.net, otherwise you can go to our website or you can contact us through Facebook or through our channel. So now um, we move to our main presentation to Mr. Samir Dosani, our co-founder and an amazing peace worker. Over to you, Samir Dosani. Thank you, Shireen. Um, <clears throat> so let me just preface this by saying that my approach to the question of, of to any question really, um, is, is to take a, a big picture historical view. So with that in mind, let's ask the question. The question that I'm trying to address is, how did we end up in this mess, essentially? Um, <clears throat> how did we end up in this mess? So, um, Sorry. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk a little bit in this presentation about um, the Bretton Woods system a little bit later, free market fundamentalism, um, which is the post Bretton Woods system world, some COVID shocks, the new normal. Um, and what the first thing we're going to focus on is the origin of the global economy. <clears throat> so would anyone like to guess? You can put it in the chat. Would anyone like to guess what you're looking at here? I'm going to play this video. Just let it play for a few seconds. What do you think this is? Hopefully everyone can find the chat button. Very good. Ship routes, routes map of colonization. 100% right. Can anyone guess the dates? Give me an approximate date of what this is representing. Are we talking 19th century, 20th century? When, when do we think these shipping routes, these trade routes are, are visualized from? 1800s is exactly right. So this is, this is the, what one researcher did was um, he, he took the average um, trade routes by season from 1750 to 1850, and he collapsed them all as if it was a single year so that we can look at it um, from January through December. Um, <clears throat> So I, I show this for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is to show that um, when we talk about globalization, it's not a new phenomenon. There have been global trade routes uh, for a long time. But the second is to show that some of this is not necessarily intuitive. 
we know about the triangle route. We know that there was a, a, a route to take manufactured goods from England to Africa, so we traded for slaves. Um, and we know that those slaves were then taken to the Americas to be traded for things like cotton and rum, rum, right? Um, and what, what sometimes is less understood is that this is actually, to the extent that we have, forget about a global economy, any modern economy, any capitalist economy, arose out of this. Mercantilism, uh, which you know, preceded capitalism, um, is, is what led for these colonial trade routes to sort of cement themselves. Um, the question I've been asking in my research is why did this happen? Not just how, but why? And the answer, I think, is that if you look for the origins of um, colonial expeditions, you'll find that Spain and Portugal were the most advanced um, sort of quasi-nation states, kingdoms in Europe. They were the richest, and they were always competing with each other. Even the richest in Europe were not anywhere near as rich as, say, um, people in Turkey or, or modern India or China, certainly. Those civilizations were far advanced to what you have in Europe in the 15th century. You, so in Europe, you have a desperation. You have a, a, a sequence of kings and queens fighting amongst each other um, in what they call the Dark Ages. Um, and you have, of course, bubonic plague and the whole thing. So, so the, the net result is that you have a, a kind of a desperation which causes uh, desperate kings and queens to invest in these uh, mercenary sailors. Um, you know, many of them Italians because Italians had the best, uh, best ships um, to try and go and find things, to try and go for, there were legends about lost cities of gold, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when those people arrived, so you look at someone like Magellan or someone like Columbus and so on, these people had an in immense amount of pressure to deliver because they had been backed, they had been invested on. They were, there were many people who were, you know, who needed them to succeed. So they had an immense amount of pressure to commodify whatever they saw. And of course they were competing with each other. They were competing with each other in Europe and they were also competing with each other in the colonies. Um, the other thing that I'll say about this is, as I mentioned, other societies, I would argue even the Aztecs and the Incas, even American societies, but certainly um, the um, Mughal India, certainly Ottoman Turkey, uh, certainly um, Ming China was far advanced in many, many ways compared to what you had in Europe. So in order for colonization to happen in a place like India, you had to have a de-industrialization, which often meant a population transfer from urban areas to rural areas, right? Um, this is not talked about enough. Um, those two principles, I'll say them again. Commodification, so everything that you find, you must be able to commodify, starting with the land, um, but even people and so on, we're talking about a brutal slave trade, um, and competition. So you are competing with each other at all times. You're never gonna trust, forget about the, the native populations. If you're a European, you're never gonna trust another European because this system is built on competition. Uh, with that said, let's fast forward a little bit. Oops, this guy, anyone know who this guy is? Hazard a guess? Again, please type in the chats. I know there's some history buffs amongst you. This isn't that ancient history. This is now, let me give you a hint. This is 19th century, yeah. Jan Smuts is a good guess, but not correct. This is Otto von Bismarck, right? So, <clears throat> um, Bismarck was the chancellor of Germany. We here in Southern Africa, we remember Bismarck because it was under him that Germany really became a colonial power. So they occupied uh, what is today Namibia and a few other places in Africa. They attempted to, to join the colonization game late. Um, but Bismarck is more well known for, cement, for doing two things, for cementing the, what is today Germany, the modern borders of Germany. Um, and he also, um, he opposed for years and years uh, the socialist program of creating um, basic guarantees, what we would today call an, in, um, a welfare state. So he opposed that for years and years, but eventually he came around and he actually implemented it as a way to um, stop the popularity of his rivals who were in communist and socialist. Now he didn't, he used the term state, state socialism or practical Christianity to describe the social insurance programs that today we would describe as the welfare state. Uh, today, it's pretty much a universal feature of our economies. Now, why was the welfare state necessary? 
Bismarck and others, and remember, these are people who have no sympathy or, you know, they, they're not necessarily, they are fully entrenched, I would argue, in the colonial economic worldview. They are all about commodifying, they're all about competing with their rivals, they're about defeating their rivals on the battle, battlefield, in the case of Bismarck. Um, but he realized that in order for a German state or any state to be stable, you needed to share the spoil, part of the spoils of your enterprises, of colonialism, of taxation, of trade. You had to share part of that to ensure a decent standard of living for all. Otherwise, you would never have stability. Uh, again, Europe in the 19th century, constant uprisings. There's the, the, the Paris Commune of 1850s, um, many other working class conflicts that come up, right? Um, so he says, he sees, and quite, pr quite, um, quite presciently, he sees the welfare state as a mechanism of survival. Uh, welfare states include some provision for public health care, but it wouldn't really be a, uh, um, it wouldn't really be a provision, it wouldn't be a universal provision of welfare states until we get to World War I. Um, okay, this one is easier. Anyone want to have a guess? I don't know the person on the left or the right, but anyone want to guess at who the person in the middle is? You can uh, write in your uh, guesses uh, in the comments. No, no, not Churchill. Yeah, there you go. Um, Vija says Keynes. Keynes is 100% correct. So um, I wanted to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm giving little snapshots here. We can go into, in the question and answer, we can go into uh, much more depth if people are interested. Um, but I focused on Keynes, not because he was right. I think Keynes was wrong about a lot of uh, very fundamental things, but because he was very powerful. And, and more than other person, he was responsible for the system that was in place, the economic system that was in place from about 1945 until 1970, that most of us know as the Bretton Woods system. Now, Keynes is interesting because he was obsessed with the question of how to, um, he himself was a speculator, by the way. He himself had made money in the markets and so on. But he had seen the damage that um, unregulated speculation had caused, how it had led to the, the, the Great Depression in the 1920s. Um, and towards the end of his life, he really um, started to worry about trends that he saw in capitalist societies. So the problem was in markets, you generally have an ebb and flow, right? And you would have, um, you have your bull markets, your bear markets, when things are going well, when people are making a loss and it all kind of you know, evens out. This is, this is the theory at least. In practice, it doesn't tend to work that way. In practice, you find that um, speculators especially, speculators have a huge percentage of the, the capital to invest and they invest that in kind of a herd mentality. So if someone makes money on the oil markets, for example, um, suddenly you find that oil market that everyone is betting that they can make money in the oil market. And it either becomes a self-fulfilling self prophecy, which it does for a little while, or it becomes a complete disaster. You have a completely over, overloaded market and you have a crash that destroys the whole system. So the question for him was, how do you prevent that from happening? And his answer was the Bretton Woods system. It didn't work out the way that he wanted. Uh, the US in the Bretton Woods conference um, lobbied very hard that the currency, so the idea was um, behind all market turmoil or behind a lot of market turmoil is uh, currency market turmoil, right? So people betting, and we see this even today, people betting that the dollar will go up two cents against my local currency or go down two cents against my local currency. Um, today, about 99, over 99% of transactions in the world are those kind of speculative transactions. Um, but he said, Look, let's try and fix that, try and fix the instability in the system by tying every currency or most currencies to um, the US dollar. This is how it worked out. This is not what he wanted. And then tying the US dollar to the value of gold. Um, so everything ultimately was backed by the US's very large gold reserves. Um, that system actually was quite, um, you know, Relatively speaking, we can say in retrospect that the world was much more stable at that period of time and that there was much less inequality as well. Um, there was a growth in wages. Um, there, was, there was quite a bit of stability um, and more equitable distribution of money. Um, so this uh, falls apart for reasons that we need not to get, get into in the 1970s with the Volcker shock um, in 1979 and before that the Nixon shock of 1971 which is where Nixon really um, destroys that currency peg uh, that it had existed until that point. 
Okay, everyone who knows who these are, so I'm not going to ask. Um, the question of what would replace the Bretton Woods system was in some ways still open in the 1980s. Um, these figures, Thatcher and Reagan, came onto the scene. Um, and it's, it's important to remember that this is not, now we look at history as if it could only have been written that way. Um, but there were big shifts to the left socially and politically um, in the 1970s. Um, union movements were very strong. So strong, in fact, that both Thatcher and Reagan had to effectively declare war against parts of their own population. We have Reagan violating the law to, to sort of put down the air traffic controller strike in 1981. Uh, Thatcher did similar things with various coal mining strikes all over the country and others. Um, so, um, you know, this insistence, now we see this as, I, I call it free market fundamentalism, other people call it neoliberalism. Um, we, we see that as kind of inevitable. I don't think it was ever inevitable. I think there, there are other possible histories. Um, anyway, what is the system that they imposed? Uh, supposedly, it was about free markets. So the rhetoric is about trade liberalization, austerity, privatization. These are policies that became known eventually as the Washington Consensus and were enforced by the International Monetary Fund and other institutions all over the world. Um, currency liberal liberalization was also part of the mix. But the system failed so spectacularly and repeatedly um, between, the, between, say, 1999 and 2001, in Argentina specifically, um, that this was abandoned by the IMF and the World Bank. Uh, the Bretton Woods Institution, somewhat ironically, um, sort of had a hand in undermining or, or not sort of learning the good lessons that came out of the Bretton Woods system. I say ironically because they have the same name, um, but they serve very different purposes prior to, say, 1975 and post-1975. Um, so, in fact, um, if we look at this, none of, this uh, none of these policies pass the free market test, right? Privatization, first of all, often means it's just a, a euphemism for corruption in most places in the world. Um, a, a strongman dictator, you can look at Mexico in the 1980s for many, many examples of this. A dictator will basically sell um, public utilities at a fraction of their actual worth. Uh, to a friend. And, and Carlos Slim, uh, the Mexican billionaire, is a beneficiary of that policy, is perhaps the world's biggest beneficiary of that policy. Um, and in order to privatize something like healthcare, you have to give huge incentives to investors. You have to essentially guarantee them profit. And we saw this in the water sector. We've seen this also in the power sector, especially if you want them to provide services for poor people, for people who can barely afford it, right? You need to guarantee them. And those guarantees end up being more costly um, in all cases that we've looked at, um, than it was to actually provide the, the service in the public sector, right? So this is uh, specifically around privatization of essential services. Um, trade liberalization, the term is a funny way of, of talking about what happened. As we've seen with the earlier slides, trade liberalization was in some ways already occurring in the 18th century. Um, but what happened was you had uh, the creation of supply chains, the creation of value chains, whereby a single company that was often still de facto headquartered in the global north, so in the US or the UK, um, but de, de jure it was often headquartered in a tax haven, so in the Cayman Islands or the British Virgin Islands um, or in the Netherlands, um, that company would create, um, would basically use different labor policies to undermine the rights and wages of its own workers. And it's no coincidence that the result of this within 10 or 15 years um, is that China, which at the time up until 2010 had the lowest wages of any um, semi-industrialized country by far, um, China ends up being the world's biggest factory. China, China ends up being the factory of the entire world, the manufacturing hub of the entire world. Um, so the other thing to say about how this failed is that there are huge shocks to the system every 10 years. So we can go back to the savings and loan scandal, we can talk about the dot-com bubbles, the most recent financial crisis none of us have been able to forget of 2007, 2008. Um, there is always a crisis. And when the crisis happens, it is not the working people who receive the bailouts. Um, the bailouts, globally speaking, in 2007, 2008, were about 40% of global GDP over the course of two years. That money was used primarily to support the banking sector. Right? Um, so it's the people who lost money in the casino economy when they should have known that they were making a bet, and if you lose money on a bet, that's it, right? Um, they had no accountability or very little accountability. Um, and meanwhile, the rest of 
um, the population uh, in the global north and also in the global south is still recovering from the wealth that was lost in 2007, 2008. So as I say, I call this free market fundamentalism. It's an attack on the welfare state at bottom. It's an attack on Bismarck. And remember, I mean, on, on, on what Bismarck had concluded. And remember, Bismarck wasn't a nice guy. Bismarck was, in many ways, some people study him as a precursor to Hitler. He was um, a nationalist. He was a right-wing a right -wing dude. He was consolidating power amongst his, his own elites. But he realized that in order to do that, he needed to fund a welfare state. Um, so, and let me also say, before I move on from this slide, this system has failed us miserably, right? So if we look in the US where healthcare has been perhaps the most privatized, certainly in the developed world, uh, we are now in the situation where nurses and healthcare workers are actually being laid off. In the meanwhile, in, in the midst of a global pandemic, when we know that hospitals are nearing maximum capacity, health workers are being laid off because people have canceled elective surgeries. Elective surgeries have been canceled for good reason. There's no reason to go to the hospital now if you don't have to. And elective surgeries are how these private hospitals make money. It is the core part of their business model. So uh, that's the extent of the failure. The institutions that are meant to be helping us at this point in time are simply not capable of doing it. Which brings us back to, which brings us to Corona. Um, so we enter 2020 um, with, a, with that free market fundamentalism still more or less unchallenged. Um, the, this virus, I will say, as someone who's, who's um, been quite deep in the literature around viruses and immunology and what a flu mutation can look like and so on. So the more I study these questions, um, the more I conclude that this is not a worst case scenario. This is nowhere near a worst case scenario. This could have been much, much worse. But it's necessitated enough changes to the economy um, to seriously damage um, all of us. Um, and when we measure that in lost GDP, as we will in a minute, so GDP is the, the buying and selling that happens all over the economy. It's how economists tend to um, measure things. I think it's a very flawed measure for a number of reasons. Um, but I'll, that said, I will put the GDP lost on the screen in a minute. Um, but when we do it that way, we understate the impact. A huge percentage of the world's population is living hand to mouth. And when they miss a paycheck or two or three, um, or if they get laid off, uh, it really is a question, it becomes a question of life or death. Um, I wanna focus on India for a second. Uh, in India, starting in the 1990s, we had the development of a two-tiered health system. Uh, India used to have a very strong public health infrastructure, um, but it has been largely defunded. India only spends 1.5% of its GDP on health spending. By contrast, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, recommends that all countries should spend a minimum of 5% on health care. Um, listen, in terms of the epidemic itself, it's unclear um, how bad India is going to be hit by this. I'd say it looks like it may not be as bad as many were predicting uh, for reasons that are, are difficult to say. It might have to do with um, seasonality and vitamin D exposure and, and things that we need not to get into. Um, but regardless, 15% of the Indian population is malnourished and another 25% are food insecure, meaning that they're just one shock away from being undernourished. So this, was, this is data from before the crisis. This is data, data, in fact, from 2018. So we can imagine if there's a shock here and if we have a government that has not mounted a robust enough response, um, which is definitely the case, um, then you have 40% of the population who have nothing to keep them from starvation. And I think it's important to mention that the blocks to uh, people not being malnourished, it's not about food availability, it's about money, it's about the, the ability to pay for it. And interestingly enough, that's more in the rural segments, the rural population has that problem to a larger extent than the urban population, in part because, uh, again, going back to the Washington consensus policies, People have been encouraged to grow cash crops. If you're growing cotton, if you're growing tobacco, if you're growing tea, those are not things that you can eat or sugarcane even. Um, you know, those are not things that can give you enough nutrition to survive. So um, we find that when rural people cannot sell their food, as now they cannot sell their food because um, people are not buying, um, there's a whole problem with the distribution system that we, we don't have to get into. But when there's a slight shock, um, you find that farmers are really uh, bear the brunt of that in India. 
Samir, if I may uh, just um, interrupt for a couple of minutes. Um, I, I would like to mention that we have um, interviews with public health specialists on the YouTube channel, uh, talking specifically about India, since Indra Samir mentioned India, how um, uh, the food security issue is really huge. Uh, in general, but given the COVID-19 pandemic, it has become uh, a disaster and people are terming it as, uh, as the second largest, um, you know, what happened at the time of partition, uh, people moving um, from uh, the migration that is happening is now, it, it's, it's being termed as the second largest migration in India's history, which is leading to immense food shortage, people don't have money to pay for food, they don't have money to pay for rent. And I would encourage people to go and listen to this um, uh, talk we had. It is, it is an interview with Dr. Vikas Bajpai, uh, who is a public health specialist, and uh, we have it in Hindi and English. Thank you. Thank you, Shri. Um, so with that said, um, you know, one of the questions that often comes up is, how do we pay for some of these measures? Um, and it's, I mean, it's worth noting that as uh, India 20 years ago didn't have a billionaire. I mean, there was no such thing. Um, and now I've only listed the top 10, but there are, there are more than two dozen billionaires in India. Now, for someone to have that amount of resources in a society that is so desperately poor, um, surely something can be done to, to redistribute those resources um, to ensure that uh, people have enough to eat. Um, <clears throat> this, as I promised, is the um, estimated lost GDP as of, um, as of today. In, in actual fact, it's probably at, estimated as of two or three days ago because these numbers take a while. Um, so according to this, uh, the world has lost about $50 billion in, in GDP, as I say. Um, but by the time things are all said and done, um, some estimates put that number closer to $5 trillion. Five trillion is about 15%, a little less than 15% of global GDP today. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about, um, as I said, GDP isn't the best measure for me. For me, at the moment, jobs is a, very, is a better measure um, because we've tied our economic and social and cultural lives in many ways to our employment. Um, this is a universal feature of all the economies that I've talked about. Um, so, when there's a, a crisis, what I'd like to point out with this slide is when there is a crisis, um, notice that suddenly we all understand which are the essential positions, which are the non-essential positions. The, the, the economy becomes bifurcated into this is essential, this is non-essential. And suddenly a bus driver is essential and a banker is not essential, right? Well, or a teacher is essential in certain ways. At least a teacher you know, has to work from home. Um, but other, others of us are, are non-essential, right? Um, those of us who, those who care and feed for the population are of course the most essential. Um, and it's important to protect those populations because if something happens there, and we've seen this with healthcare workers in Italy and elsewhere, um, if, if this virus starts infecting large amount of healthcare workers, it can really paralyze healthcare systems um, in, in, in the north of Italy, as I say, and, and a few other places. Uh, so, what comes next? Um, I think there's two options. I think we already see elites um, moving to reinstate uh, the system that was already taking shape, which was already shifting away from uh, what I, what again, would call the neoliberal or the free market fundamentalist order towards the neo-fascist order. This is what's coming next, right? It was already starting. Um, but when you have this kind of a shock, right? Um, then your, the neo-fascist uh, dictators can get a lot of strength. And when I talk with uh, people who are much older than myself, I, the echoes uh, of this moment to the 1920s and 1930s with the rise of fascism in Europe um, are very real, right? So I think that there's a, a chance, I think that elite forces are trying to move back to a kind of status quo, to things as they were before. Um, and I think it's more likely that this branch of the elites, a sort of neo-fascist branch of the elites, will be able to, to use the current moment to consolidate their own power 
And I think we can look at things like um, questions about monitoring people's movements and so on, which may be necessary as a form of social solidarity. Um, but they're seeing that as a form of social control. And they're already talking about how they're going to tap into cell phone records and so on to know exactly where everyone is at all time. times. In, in India, we've seen this as an excuse to crack down on dissent, to um, arrest journalists uh, who were covering the stories in Kashmir, um, to um, stop the protests that were really in full swing in January and February against the Citizens Amendment Act and so on, which we've talked about in other webinars. Um, so there is another option. Um, the other option is to stop worshiping at the cult of the free market um, and, uh, and to learn from societies that do better than we do when it comes to taking care of their own people. So here I think um, we get caught up in the phrase policy reform. Uh, we don't need new policy. I myself am guilty of this. I've, I've um, written lots of policy reform documents over the years. Um, we don't need new policies. We need social transformation. The current structures are rooted in principles that will kill us. Commodification and competition will literally kill all of us. Um, you see this very clearly in the case of Trump, who's currently dismantling. This isn't getting as much publicity as it should be. But President Trump is dismantling the non-proliferation treaties with Russia um, that have, you know, somewhat imperfectly stopped the world from going to nuclear war for the past 50 years. Uh, so on the one hand, he's doing that. Um, and on the other hand, he's, he's continuing to push for subsidies for fossil fuels. And if we look at any of the predictions for global, global warming, uh, what we've just experienced is a very small bump compared to um, what we may be seeing in 10 or 20 years as a result of global warming shocks. Um, so as I say, these are threats that could end the human species. Trump is just an extreme version of the status quo. They're, they're the most leaders, nearly all leaders, I would certainly put our own leader here in South Africa, Cyril Ramaphosa, in this, in this, uh, on this road. They're all driving down the same highway, and the end of the highway is a brick wall. Um, some are driving at 100 miles an hour, or 100 kilometers an hour, as Trump is, and some are driving a bit more slowly, but it's the same road. There are alternatives. There are indigenous, non-colonial knowledge systems from which we can learn a lot. I'm studying some of them here, here in Southern Africa. This is, these are some uh, photos from Brazilian uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, sorry, not Brazilian, Bolivian. Um, so there are alternatives. Um, and the main learnings, what we have to take from these knowledge systems, these non-colonial knowledge systems, the main thing that we have to take is um, we, we have to acknowledge that the colonial knowledge system, the colonial um, uh, cultural and economic system has taken us too far towards commodification and competition, as I've said. So we need to look to indigenous cultures to teach us about institutions that can encourage us to share, right? The opposite of competition is cooperation. So we need to be encouraged to share with one another. We need to be encouraged to cooperate with one another beyond all boundaries, black, white, tribal, non-tribal, whatever, whatever, however we identify, we need more cooperation. Um, and the opposite of commodification. Now, this is a word that I've struggled with. Um, it doesn't have it doesn't have the best connotations. But the words that I use, the word that I use is stewardship. In other words, we must come to we must be part of an ecological system. We must acknowledge that we are just one species on a massive planet. We must come to some kind of balance with our planet, with our natural environment. And in biblical terms, this was referred to as stewardship. Different indigenous cultures refer to it with different terms. But these are the two principles that we must rediscover, cooperation and stewardship. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Shiri. Hello, everyone. Once again, thank you so much that uh, you are here with us. The presentation is now finished, but we are now open to discussion and questions. Um, if there are any specific concerns or things that you really would like to know about, please do write in the comments section or raise your hand. Um, I mean, you know, just raise it like this. There is a, uh, there's a little,
button in the button center. at the bottom of the screen. Um, please remember that uh, we are here in our webinar, which is aiming towards understanding of of how peace is threatened, and certainly not having. Um, economic justice is uh, is a, a threat to peace. I would uh, very much like to read to you um, a, a quote by MLK, by Martin Luther King Jr. He said, the problem of racism, the problem of economic exploitation, and the problem of war are all tied together. These are the triple evils that are interrelated. And I think this is um, something that we must think about. And perhaps this will start a discussion today on this forum. Once again, the, the quote by MLK, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, an amazing hero, uh, a messenger of peace. His quote is, the problem of racism the problem of economic exploitation and the problem of war are all tied together. These are the triple evils that are interrelated. And of course, when we say racism, it has various um, um, you know, connotations depending on where you are. Um, racism is, is also seen in the caste system. Racism is also seen in many other ways. So yes, let us start. I think some of you already have questions coming in. Should we move yeah. the, the so, background to the, uh, to the poster? Sure. And friends, please feel free to make your own interconnections and, and write down what, um, what is coming to your mind. This is a, a safe space. This is a, a space of peace and no need to feel discouraged, disheartened, or shy. Fantastic. So I think since we just have a few questions, I'm going to ask people to actually, um, to actually say them. So Shine, can I turn to you first? I will uh, just turn your mic on. Um, and uh, if you could just tell us a bit about, uh, about your question, what, you, what do you mean by polarity? So uh, hi. So basically by polarity, I mean that, mean that you know, there, are, there are very few people who are centrist or even if those people who call themselves centrist are like they tend to be leaning on either the side of liberals or on the side of uh, conservatives my thing is that you know there are conservatives the people who support the churches the people who support um, all these temples and stuff at the time they they support industrialists so it's ironic because i feel that People who are supporting the churches should be more humanitarian, but these days they are supporting capitalists and giving out, uh, doling out monies to industrialists. So I think that kind of setup is enabling capitalists. And I believe that socialism um, takes a back seat. Thanks for that, Shine. I mean, I think. You know, I, I, I struggle with this sometimes because I think, you know, if we look, for example, at some of the companies in Modi's Gujarat, right? So you look at the Tata, if you look at, um, you know, some of the sort of, you know, old fashioned industrial houses, they were actually quite hostile to Modi in the original sort of post 2002 phase. So Modi, for those, I think everyone knows, yeah. Um, okay, at the list of participants, I think everyone will know who Modi is. Um, but, but, so after the Gujarat riots, um, they were quite hesitant. And there's an, even a, 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 um, an account which has since been taken off the internet, but it's a fantastic account of a meeting where Modi was invited and was basically humbled. This, I'm talking about 2003, 2004, when he was chief minister of Gujarat. He was basically told, look, we don't like this Hindu Muslim divide and rule kind of stuff. And he then made it very difficult for them. Now, these are people who are head of an institution. They're, they're not individuals per se. They are people who play a, a societal role, an institutional role. They are the CEOs of certain houses, that, uh, industrial houses that have to make profit according to their own logic. So when Modi was able to interfere with that, 
they all, 100% of them, stopped talking about um, you know, the need for plurality, pluralism, and so on. They stopped funding efforts like the efforts at ActionAid um, that I was a part of that were you know, anti-communal efforts and so on. And they, uh, they were forced to toe the line, you see? So this question about, um, you know, will there, will there still be some kind of center? You see, government and business are very much uh, part of the same process here. Um, and uh, so, in, you know, if we look even at, at Mussolini's definition of fascism, he calls fascism corporatism. So there's, there's a tendency towards this um, right-wing top-down push. And it's an institutional tendency, not a, an individual tendency. Does that answer your question, Shine? Mm -hmm. uh, Shine also, I would like yeah. to recognize people who are uh, religious in a true sense. They do believe in the, in the essence of all the religions that are in the world. And the essence is really humanity. Uh, if they do believe in that, I also feel that the failure of, uh, of the movement that we have not been able to reach the churches and the mosques and the synagogues and the speak gurdwaras uh, with the message, uh, which is the overriding message, which is peace and humanity. So perhaps we need to work harder so that, um, you know, mm -hmm. temples of God, temples of humanity are not turned into hate inciting, uh, sort of hate creating places. Okay, okay. yeah. Like in case of in case of US, because right now, I think in India they were like industrialists were made to shut up. But what about US? I think in the US it's very much the same um, the same story. So if we look, for example, at Davos, um, mm -hmm. this Davos meeting. Which, which, sorry, Shad, I'm going to put you back on mute. Okay? Um, so okay. if we look at this uh, Davos meeting, industrialists. Um, um, so this is um, something that happens. It's not just U.S. firms; it's firms all over the world. Um, but they generally don't like Trump, right? Trump, uh, Trump was their first speech that they heard. Um, but they know that Trump can make them a lot of money. So you can go online; you can see Trump's speech to Davos in January 2020. I mean, they just went crazy. They were just drooling at the mouth. They love him. They they pretended to love him at least because they want a share of the money, right? Um, so I think what I'm describing specifically with regard to India, I think it's a global tendency um, in, in terms of, of, I don't call them capitalist economies, I call them colonial economies, which may be, um, may be a, a, a real difference or not, but we can, we can talk about that. Sami, do you think also that we must mention that there is always a, a, another side, you know, everywhere we have seen in the world, in the US uh, particularly, the churches were the biggest supporters of um, of the civil rights um, uh, movement, you know the the black churches they 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 came together to to talk against hate. They came together to talk about equality. Similarly, in South Africa, uh, even though there was a, a talk of racism in churches, you know, the Africana churches, but there were also churches that talked against racism and they, they were the first to include uh, black South Africans in schools and in, um, in sports and so on. Similarly, in India, we have the Sufi and the Bhakti traditions that go against some of the hateful messages preached through temples and mosques and so on. So I think we need to also yeah. look at, at that. And our next webinar, for those who've been following us, will be on the Sufi and Bhakti traditions and how they have promoted peace uh, historically. That'll be a week from this Saturday, uh, May the 9th, uh, at the same time as, as this one. Um, Aradita, um, can I ask you to, um, to give us your question now? Uh, I was... Uh... I mean, I just wanted to ask, like, what is the hope of socialism rising in you in the post-COVID period? Or is there any hope at all? No, I mean, uh, the EU is, um, you know, is less of a free market fundamentalist bloc um, than the US, uh, first yes. of all. Um, but secondly, I, I, for me, the question is not socialism. It's also the question of what form of socialism. 
So for example, um, I attended a conference back in 2005. Um, I was invited to give a talk in Italy and all of the socialist parliamentarians all over Europe came. And I thought I would be speaking with people like myself, um, and, but there were, you know, there's maybe one or two other people sort of like myself. Um, and the other people were people like Tony Blair, were people like, um, you know, so very mainstream center left kind of parties, which fall within the same, they call themselves socialist, and, but, but it's the same spectrum of policies now. The left right divide doesn't, doesn't matter so much um, in the European context. So what I'm talking about, when I'm talking about hope, I'm talking about structural transformation of these economies, of, of, our, of the way we define the economy. So there are things that are being talked about like um, universal basic income, for example, which is the law of the land, um, in places like France um, and Finland uh, to a large extent, but are being experimented with here in South Africa, in the UK and many other places. That could theoretically um, lead to a kind of, that could be part of, of policies that change the way in which we produce and consume you know, what we need to survive. But they don't necessarily have to be that. They could also be things that could, so they could sort of bail out the status quo. So I, I can't answer the question, there's too much, it depends too much on what we all do and what Europe does. I think some of it also depends on how the leaders take it. So there is a personal element in it. For instance, as, as we know, the prime minister of uh, the United Kingdom is very pro disinvestment from public um, services. You know, he's very big on privatization. Uh, he, he was not a huge supporter of putting money into NHS, uh, which is their health system, but he got pretty badly sick and was saved by NHS and has gone on record saying that NHS saved me and he's thanked the nurses and the doctors so hopefully when people suffer you know when they have the 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 misery that uh, the common people are also suffering hopefully that will change their perspective i can only hope as a peace educator i don't know if, if it will um, change things but i i hope that the personal element you know that personal experience may also turn people towards uh, thinking in a more um, a more um, sort of cooperative, more, more um, public friendly, more people friendly way rather than profit friendly way. Fantastic. Thank you, Radhita. Do you have such hope in, do you have such hope in India in some sense? Uh, right now, looking at the situation, um, Radhita, I doubt very much that um, India has hope. Uh, also, because we must remember that the present government is extremely authoritarian. Um, so, you know, unless the real sense of democracy returns in the country, I, I doubt very much that they, they will care, you know, the, the ruling people will care. However, we do have uh, very strong voices coming from civil society in India, uh, where people are calling out. Um, however, as I've said, you know, it's such an authoritarian government, people are being put behind bars every single day we hear uh, cases. There are some extremely high profile uh, activists that have been put behind bars. So to be very honest, I, ha I have little hope from the present government hopefully if more uh, more democracy returns to india we can hope something will change thank you so much Aradita. i'm going to put you back on um on uh, mute eh? um mr uh, henry may i ask you to go next or lotia i don't know how you um how you go i'm going to just uh, enable your microphone Oh, I think maybe you don't have a microphone um, because it's not letting me unmute you. So let me just take your question. So it's, it's something about the future of work and opportunities ahead. Um, so this has been a huge discussion with the so-called gig economy and you know Uber and, and Airbnb and all of these things. Um, I, I would phrase the question more broadly than it is generally phrased. Um, so I would, I would phrase the question in terms of what is the future of consumption, production, um, how are humans going to relate in the post-COVID world? So I, I think, you know, if we look back to, I was reading Adam Smith today to prepare for this. Um, Adam Smith talks about, you know, if, we, if there's someone who makes a nice chair, 
but he's, he's copying, he's been taught how to do it. Um, we may like the chair, but we'll never respect the person. So that's, that's Adam Smith, that's the father of capitalism, um, giving something like a theory of wage slavery. You know, jobs are, and this is, that's a Marxist term. So jobs uh, for a Marxist are nothing more than being paid. You're, you're trading your hours to be someone's servant. And so traditionally, um, you know, not just Marxists, many, many sort of people from the Scottish Enlightenment tradition, including Adam Smith, saw that as something reprehensible. So I think we need to actually ask the question of what, you know, what should not work look like? What should we do in order to contribute to society in a meaningful way as individuals, as communities? How can we support each other, um, especially in light of the current epidemic, uh, especially to deal with questions of, of basic survival? Because frankly, with global warming coming, with the chance that this is, we've had a, a, a COVID um, outbreak every five or six years, or maybe every 10 years since 2001, right? Since, since SARS-1. So um, this is not gonna be the last of its kind. This might be some, you know, I, I think this might be something like a new normal for all of us. And if that's the case, how do we rebuild our societies to be able to cope with that? I think that's a, a better framing of the question. Do I have an answer to it? I'm afraid not really. Um. I would uh, like to add here that um, from the perspective of peace studies, we must also go back uh, to some of the ideas that were given to us uh, by people before us who worked on peace. And one of the ideas is to have smaller economies. I don't know if that is an answer, but to have smaller economies that are self-sufficient. So for instance, where I live right now, if I want to buy vegetables, I have to go to one of those grocery chains. I don't have any other option. Um, in, the, in the smaller economy models, we will have um, a food growing, being produced in our small localities. So you could buy, for instance, fresh milk from the local person. It doesn't have to be in a village, even small towns, you know, cities can be uh, divided into smaller um, uh, pieces where economy works and, you know, there's self, uh, self uh, sufficiency. So if, for instance, you want to buy a shirt, there should be a, a few local tailors who will make those things for you. There will be spinach and corn or whatever you need in your local area, which right now is not a reality for, especially for the Western world, but also increasingly in the developing world. Great. So with that, um... Uh, Baija, can I ask you maybe to ask your question? I'll, I'll just put your microphone on. Well, I think basically I'm asking um, how does, how does, uh, well, what, what would you suggest could replace uh, capitalism as an econo economic system? And whatever it's replaced by, how does it um, sync with democracy or uh, freedom of choice? So in the example Shri gave uh, is that um, somebody is then telling me that uh, I should uh, only shop uh, you know, within my area, or that the, the clothes I wear should be within this. Uh, whereas I feel uh, in a more capitalist system, the choices are mine rather than dictated by somebody else. So that's one, uh, one part of the question. The other part of the question is, uh, is all of capitalism such a bad system? Or is it possible that capitalism needs uh, a lot of regulation so that uh, it can function best for a people. After all, I, I feel that money is important in a nation, but so it's important to generate the money, but what do you generate the money for if it's not for the people and their well-being and for all the people? So are there regulations that could ensure that? Thank you, Bajan. Um, Shirin, you want to? Yes. Uh, uh, specifically about choices, I would say that um, the systems that we have in place right now are actually anything but uh, choice-oriented. People do not have the choice that we are talking about. 
if a person is poor, he or she can only shop at Walmart, can only buy food that is cheap. So yes, we are giving uh, uh, an impression that people have choices, but actually they don't. If a person is sick, that person cannot just get up and go to the doctor, has to go through the insurance that is available to that person given um, their economic situation. Uh, for instance, let me now mention, you know, when it comes, uh, the most basic thing is food, and we talked about it. Um, for the majority of the world, which is poor, uh, the nutritional value of the food that they're get getting is very poor. And why is it? It's because they cannot actually access good quality food. So it is a matter of choice. It's not like they don't want good food. They don't have the option of buying good food. When we go and buy shampoo, yes, we have 50 shampoo bottles that we can choose from. That is not choice. Choice is about food, health, and where we can live. The poor do not have the choice of living in the brightest suburbs of Delhi or Washington or, or Johannesburg. They don't have it. So I think there is a, an idea that capitalism gives, gives choices. It actually doesn't. It gives choices to you depending on your economic strata. And for the poor, there's actually really no choice. The second thing I'd like to mention, I think, which Samir will talk about in more detail, is that when we criticize uh, an existing structure, there is no A alternative. People have worked with various alternatives, maybe even a mix of two or three things in various parts of the world. So the question to something that is not working is not uh, something very specific that is that we can say, okay, this is what works because humans don't work in that way. You know, humans, according to the culture, according to food uh, requirements, according to age groups, they are all working differently. So I think we'll have to find what is best for us. What will work, for instance, in, um, in New Delhi, will not work in Johannesburg. So we have to look at our strengths and our weaknesses and come to something that will work for us. And we certainly do not have, have answers for, for all of it. Uh, passing on to Samir. Oh, great. I see people have been typing in the Q&A. Um, and I think uh, just to ask you to copy and paste those in the chat. Um, if you haven't opened your chat, you should see, um, you know, if I type something, you should see that it glows and when it glows, just, just go there. So sorry, the, the, the speakers list is going to be a little bit, I, I think we're going to stop um, taking individual speakers one by one and I'll just go through some of these questions. Listen, just to follow up on what Shirin said with regard to the, um, to Vijay's question. Um, listen, there's a standard answer to your question. The standard answer from both the socialist and the capitalist side is yes, markets are there and markets need to be regulated. But what I'm seeing in both capitalist and in socialist uh, situations is that the, the potential for public interest to become cor cor corrupted and co-opted, that is the tendency. There is, uh, there is, and that tendency is almost um, unstoppable because the underlying logic of the system, as I've said, is towards commodification for the few. So until you have one person having all the wealth, that just keeps on going and going and going because it's about commodification and competition. This is the logic. When I talk about Europe being the most backward place in the 15th, 16th century, I don't mean to insult Europeans, but it's, it's just kind of, a, a, kind of the truth um, in the sense that they were so desperate that they needed to put together systems that would maximize their wealth in the short term to pay for armies. Uh, whereas you look, like the, you look at the Aztecs, the Aztecs were debating moral philosophy amongst themselves. In, in something like an agora, a Greek agora, similar kind of situations, right? So the Aztecs were far advanced from where the Europeans were. But the Europeans were advanced in one thing, and that was theft. So when we have a society that is based on theft, a global society, that society has been able to do very many great things, been able to build houses, build buildings, and so on, but it's been built on the back of theft. So when we're talking about what should replace that, it, as Shirin says, it will look different in different places, but it needs to be redistribution to the people from whom we have stolen, or to the descendants of people from whom we have stolen. So this is where we talk about reparations for colonialism, reparations for slavery, um, and so on. Um, 
Devorshi, um, actually, maybe I will ask you to um, please make an intervention. Um, and then uh, I'll go to you next, Ursula, if that's okay. Uh, uh, hi, well, excellent talk. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, what you talked about rising neo-fascism or whatever, that's certainly reminiscent of the 1930s. And people have been saying that we are going to see a great a depression, which will be like as probably as big as the Great Depression or somewhere close to it. Uh, and the last time we had that, we, of course, you know, that led to the Second World War, that led to Hitler and so on. Uh, but the difference to me now is that we also have China. I mean, so we have already been, the world has already been leaning like, quite to the right in the last 10 years since 2008, essentially. But of course, now we have another economic system as well. And, um, you know, if the current U.S. system like decays so much that, I mean, they still have the military, that's the point. So they still have their huge army. So are they likely to start a war? Um, or are people going to be influenced, you think, by... The fact that we do have an, an alternative system. It's, I'm not saying that they, you know, they are socialist or something, but they're certainly quite different from what, what Europe or uh, the US is. So like, what do you think, how do you think that's going to influence both you know, the policies, militarily, and people as well, people's opinions? Thanks for that, Devoshi. Listen, I, I don't play the game of, um, of, of predicting the future. Um, I think that um, you know, I, I think what, what what we're going to see what happens. But I think there are pressures that can tell us um, something. First, let me respond to this question about is China an alternative system or not? Um, I've spent a lot of time in China. The more time I spend in China, the more I, I think of it as an extremely capitalist society on many, many different levels. It does have unique features. It invested in that welfare state provision in a very heavy way in the 1970s and 1980s. It's healthcare, you know, if you look at the, the number of hospital beds per person, in many provinces, it's on par with, um, you know, Europe. So I, I think I think you're right, and I think um, Vijay is also right to say that capitalism has looked different in many different places. Socialism looks a little bit different from that, but not, you know, or, or Chinese socialism specifically, not hugely. Um, it is it is trying to, you know, the, the Chinese model was. Um, the one thing where they differ from many of the countries that I work in is that they, they do a much better job of planning. So they say they write 30 year plans, 50 year plans, and they, they take measures to actually get there. But those measures take into account that they are not the ones setting the rules in the global economy. So they have to sort of play by the, you know, when China gained accession to the WTO in the 1990s, that was a strategic plan by the, by the West to allow them ascension to exploit Chinese labor but the Communist Party of China also was complicit in that plan and, and allowed it to happen and needed it to happen for their, to meet their own targets, right? So it's, it's a little bit complicated and that's why I don't like using the terms socialist and capitalist. I think they're more or less meaningless. I think everyone means the same thing by both socialist and capitalist, which is regulated markets. There's nothing else really in the world right now. And what I'm saying is that what exists in the world right now will not be enough. So whether that will lead someone like Donald Trump to you know, ramp up his wars. Remember, the U.S. has been at war pretty much, you know, since World War II, nonstop. Um, so the war is already happening. The, the Pentagon already functions as a huge um, socialist uh, enterprise within the so-called capitalist United States of America. That's already going on. What it'll look like in the future, it could be ramped up. Um, we certainly see a lot of rhetoric against China that could turn into something hot even. I, I kind of doubt it, just because the global, uh, these countries are so enmeshed in relations, in, in um, symbiotic relations, I would call them. Uh, I would uh, like to add a couple of things. One is that I would strongly encourage people uh, to not fall into the trap of this whole rhetoric drama that goes on between political leaders. So we are told, for instance, that we are a democracy and they are not. And what it does is it prevents us from looking at the problems in our own system. So when Trump comes and tells us, or Modi comes and tells us, oh, we are a democracy, so we are much better than those. We have to first actually start questioning what they are saying. So, you know, it's it's not a black and white situation here because we, we know very well what happens in the United States. There are 
so many people who, who have not been able to vote because of their skin color. We also know that the democratic system that is in existence in the United States has been questioned by many political scientists around the world that it is not a fair system. There are states that are completely ignored because of population or other, you know, I mean, even a political scientist has such a hard time understanding the American uh, democratic system. Similarly, in India, for instance, uh, is democracy really um, working? Is democracy really functional? Is, is democracy perfect? No. So I think the politicians are very good at dividing us and telling us we are better than them. So, you know, I, I would strongly encourage uh, everyone here uh, from a peace education point of view not to get into, into that. I think we have to find ways where we make ourselves better before pointing fingers at others because we are also quite complicit in this whole system. We are actually buying the products created by those Chinese workers who are being paid pittance. Now, we are buying it because it is cheap for us. And it then prevents us from questioning the injustices in our own society. Why is it that a poor person in the United States has to buy a $5 t-shirt? It is a big question. Why is it that uh, the cheapest plastic products have to be bought in India by the poor? That is coming from China. So I think there are all these interconnections that have to be made. And it is not simply a question between democracy and, and communism or socialism. Uh, China is far from what one would call socialism or communism. Certainly it's different, but, but it's not uh, the opposite of capitalism. Mm. Well, thanks for that, Devashi. This is a long discussion. I'm sorry we don't have time for more uh, debates. Uh, Ursula, I'm going to go to you next, please. Actually, I sent you the information. And really, I'd like to go back to smaller economies, uh, economies and self-sufficiency. This has been talked about for the last 20, 25 years, not from the economic side, but from the environmental side. And there's a lot of written material on this coming out of Germany. For instance, you will probably know the very well, uh, the very good example of the strawberry um, yogurt. And in, I think it was in Stuttgart and instead of having all these little containers shipped from one end of Europe to the other end, they should manufacture the yogurt locally for a certain perimeter. So this is not something new. No, 100%. I, I don't think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're, I don't think we're Yeah, no, as a, as mentioned in my interjection, this is an idea that has been given to us by many peace educators and activists and environmentalists before us. Yeah. So certainly it's not a new idea. Um, yeah. One example that I will give from, uh, from British India is that of cotton. And I think many of you may already know this, but cotton was produced in India. It was then sent to the United Kingdom from where uh, the factory workers used to make then shirts and pants and so on and then it was sold back in India and it was extremely expensive and so Gandhi's answer because I am a peace educator um, I, I love you know these these stories is that Gandhi's answer to that was the humble charkha you know the the home homespun cloth and I, I'm not suggesting that we go back to it I'm giving it to you as an example that you know if we have cotton that we are producing and we have the capacity to actually make clothes out of that cotton that is a much better system than sending it out you know thousands of kilometers away um, to another land where it is produced and then sent back to us and by the way the workers who produced those pants and shirts in England were not paid well that is the reason why they actually sided with the British um, uh, with the anti-British movement in India so when Gandhi went to to the UK he was actually hosted by the the workers of the cotton mills 
in the United Kingdom. And so this supported the movement against British colonialism. Um, and it, it's amazing if you look back in history that the, the, the mill, mill workers would, were actually losing their jobs because of what Gandhi was doing. And yet they supported the movement against British colonialism because they knew that they were also being exploited in the same system. Fantastic. Sorry, we don't have time for more conversation. I, on that, I'll just say that my own first work on uh, anything to do with economics was a critique of Gandhian economic theory, which is very much based on the localization stuff. So sorry, we're not going to take uh, more people by, by uh, call, but I'll just go through the questions that are um, unanswered. Let me just make sure that we haven't, I haven't missed anything here. Yeah, I haven't missed anything there. So um, Farid said, uh, instead of trying to dismantle capitalism, why can't we keep it and enhance the welfare aspects of the state? So, so what I've understood in my, and I'm happy to share my more academic, um, longer papers, which, which will give you all the references and so on. But what I've come to understand is that um, the balance, and I think Keynes kind of understood this too, um, that when you have a capitalist class, a business class um, coming from the elites, and you have governments who are largely from the same class, uh, sooner or later, you can have uh, hostile relations between the two for a while, um, but sooner or later they converge and you find that that need to commodify, to loot, to steal, overrides everything. And we see this when we do a history of the 19th century and, and the so-called robber barons and so on. And you can do the same history now with Reliance and, and some of the big firms in, in India, or um, with the, the um, you know, Raytheon and Boeing and some of these massive U.S. companies, Monsanto, um, which is now owned by Bayer. I mean, it, it's a huge mess. Like the, so the pharmaceutical world is just rife with conflicts of interest and, and capitalism working really, really poorly. So theoretically, I think that's what I believed, you know, a decade ago. And what I've done is I've, as I've uh, understood the principles of the economic system that we're, we're working within, I've come to understand that it's the principles itself that will lead us to the destruction of the species. So it comes down to, do you want to save the human species or not? And my answer is yes, I want to. Uh, Sujata asks, looking at the three economic systems you're most familiar with, South Africa, India, and the US, which do you think is most likely to be res resilient in the face of this pandemic? It's very tough to say. Um, hard to say by what you mean. It depends on what you mean by resilience. Um, the US is so much at the center and also depends on what you mean by economic system. So if we're talking about GDP uh, or even something like GDP per capita, the US is such a linchpin of the global economic system that nothing, even this, is going to affect it very much. Um, but if you mean working people in the US, they're, they're mostly 40% of working people in the US, uh, in fact, almost 50% of the working people in the US have no savings. They have a negative, a negative net worth. They have more debt than they have assets, right? So if you're talking about what it means for those 50% of the population, I mean, it's gonna be a disaster. And the same for India. And the same for South Africa. It's actually, you know, in South Africa, that figure is more like 70%, right? Um, the 1% has been doing pretty well. Billionaire net worth has, has been going up in all of these countries. So it depends on what we mean by these terms. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I, I think the US is, is in the best position just because of what it is. None of them have great responses. South Africa has been, um, you know, I think has been trying to do the right thing, but doesn't have the money to do it very well. Um, Ursula, we've already spoken with. Um, Shamsul Islam says, in India, ruling classes may be called upon citizens to fight COVID-19, but the private healthcare system has two thirds of the bed, 80% of the ventilators, employs four out of five doctors, and the country has betrayed the fight. Um, most of the big so-called health providers have closed their shops. Many of them are not admitting, admitting COVID-19 patients unless they pay private charges. Was the EU, uh, the EU, of course, is much, much better than all this. Um, EU, EU still has a public healthcare system. The EU didn't buy um, Thatcher's rhetoric. Um, after this, I think it'll be much harder for Boris Johnson to sell the NHS to Donald Trump. That's clearly what he wanted to do a few months ago, um, but I, I don't think he'll be able to do that now. Um, so I think the EU is a place where that aspect of the welfare state has not been under attack. Um, I think the better question, um, uh, uh, Professor Islam, is, is what do we, you know, what are we going to do in India about all this? And I, I think the answer there is that we need to, if those beds are lying empty, we need, the state needs to take them. They need to be public uh, assets. Um, that's something that can be done immediately. These are companies that are going bankrupt. It wouldn't cost the government much to, to buy them, right? 
and make them part of the, uh, of the system. That's also the case, by the way, for other things. I mean, we look at the price of oil. Um, how much would it cost to you know, buy the oil companies and, and sort of permanently deal with the threat of, of global warming? Not a lot of money, um, comparatively speaking. So I think these are the kind of questions that we need to be asking. In order to do that, as I said um, when I was responding to the earlier question, you need to have um, a state that doesn't have, does, is not identical to the corporate elites. So at the moment, it's hard to imagine these kind of things happening in India or the US, um, but they do need to happen eventually. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Shirin. Yes, um, we are towards the end of the webinar. I would like from Pete's vigil, to conclude with three uh, points that we um, think should be mentioned here before we end. One is that there is a general tendency um, to believe that be you are rich because you worked hard. And certainly you can be rich because you worked hard, but that doesn't mean that the people who are not rich have not worked hard. Uh, Harsh Mandar, who is one of India's um, brightest um, human rights activist. He was also the director of uh, ActionAid International. Um, he um, said once that, you know, it is all right to say that you're very, very hardworking and you reached the top, but to say that you, you shouldn't have to give any part of that money that you earned to people who don't have so much, they don't even have enough to eat, is highly irresponsible because those people who don't have enough to eat also work very hard and they do not cause any damage to the economy or the world. And so it is our social responsibility to share what we have through the labor of others because we didn't do it alone. If we are a huge industrialist, there were many, many workers and their, their sweat that went into it. It is our responsibility to pay into the system um, for healthcare, uh, for education, for housing and so on. The second thing that I must point out here is that when we are looking at the misery of people around the world due to COVID-19, we are seeing people who were working they were actually earning members of the society who have now been turned into beggars. And it is not just in India, but in the United States as well, also to some extent in South Africa. But these were people who were earning their living. They may have been living hand to mouth, um, you know, they may have been earning very little, but these were people who had the dignity of labor being practiced. They had, they had jobs, whatever jobs they had. Now they are beggars, which begs, you know, which really puts this question um, out that we have an economy where one month of not working can turn people into beggars. And we, we need to question what kind of an economy that is. Because for the rich, that one month is not going to turn them into beggars. But for the majority, it is turning them into beggars. So we need to question that, that system, which does not allow a person to even have a month of an emergency. You know, that person is now out on the street and is begging for food. And lastly, we firmly believe at Peace Vigil that we cannot go back to the systems that we have had for the last few decades. Um, we need to think of something different. Again, we do not have all the answers, certainly not, but we have to be as creative as we can as human beings, and human beings have been creative in the past and come up with something different. The good thing when we look around is the skies are clearer, uh, there's less pollution, sound, um, you know, pollution is also less, um, there's less fumes out, out there, uh, you know, and all this should make us think what is necessary and what is not. And there is certainly a, a reason for us to think of something different, think of something creative. We don't have to put everything into the dustbin, um, perhaps take what is good, add more things that are good, uh, but certainly we cannot go back to, to what has failed so miserably in this crisis. Um, I thank you once again for participating and I'd like to mention that uh, we are a peace education, um, uh, could, could I go back to the slideshow please? The P we are a peace education um, organization. 
um, and we uh, want uh, people to get involved in these peace education efforts. Our whole aim is to empower people. As it says in the eye there, you can see it says peace needs all of us. So we really do want you to be involved in these efforts. The first thing you could do, if it doesn't trouble you too much, is to please subscribe to our channel, which is the Peace Vigil channel. If you just do a Google search, Peace Vigil on Google, Peace Vigil channel, it will take you to our YouTube channel. You will see this eye there. Um, so please do subscribe to it. It has some wonderful videos that help people to understand peace and go ahead and work towards uh, a more peaceful society. Also, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Very easy to do. You can just go to the Peace Vigil website. It's a very easy address, peacevigil.net. Also, please do write to us and send us WhatsApp messages. Tell us what more can be done. After all, we are all in this together. Um, we also have experts speaking on our channel about things that encourage people to work for peace. So, uh, you know, we don't like to add an uh, end on a discouraging note and saying, oh, the world is doomed and we can't do anything. No, our whole idea is, is hope. So we want you to get involved. Please do get involved, write to us, email us, you know, send us messages and we can do this together. And hopefully when international travel resumes, we will uh, start doing our workshops and our trainings again within South Africa and abroad. Unfortunately, we had to cancel our US trip. Um, with that, I thank you uh, from Peace Vigil. Uh, for having participated in this webinar. We have another one coming next Saturday, which is on poetry against hate. Our very esteemed resource person in that webinar is uh, Dr. Muazzam Siddiqui, uh, who is um, uh, uh, somebody who knows poetry from India really well. Uh, both Urdu and Hindi, and he will be speaking about poetry against hate. We are starting with him, but that series will continue and we will cover poetry from other parts of the world as well. It will be at the same time as today, but on Saturday the 9th. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you at this webinar, and I wish you a peaceful and healthful month ahead. And also, yes, um, happy International Labor Day, which is tomorrow, 1st of May. Thank you very much. Peace be with you all.